The theremin is a remarkable musical instrument for two reasons. First of all, it's one of the earliest electronic instruments, a kind of Ur synthesizer that paved the way for all the electronic music we hear today. It was invented in 1919 by Leon Theremin, and for a long time it sounded so completely unlike anything else that it would often be used in film music to represent the eerie or alien. The second remarkable thing is that you play this instrument without touching it. You just move your hands in the air in front of two antennas. The right hand controls pitch and the left hand controls volume. This is my own take on the theremin and here the sound is coming from the SID chip of the Commodore 64. The interface is the same as on the original theremin. So you've got your volume and your pitch. But as you can hear, these parameters are now controlling a classic C64 lead sound, the modulated pulse wave. And uh, yeah, this is hard. I'll do my best. How does a theremin even work? Well, I'll tell you, but I'm going to keep it simple and gloss over a lot of details. Because, you know, how could I describe the theremin without some hand waving? But I've also posted a more thorough technical write-up on my website. So if this video tickles your curiosity and you want to get a deeper understanding, then be sure to head over and read that. The link is in the video description. But here's the less technical version. First, to clear up any confusion, a theremin doesn't work with radio signals at all. The antennas are just lumps of metal of any shape, and they're part of a quite simple electronic circuit. But the word circuit suggests that something goes around and comes back to the starting point. And here it would seem that any electricity entering through the wire would reach a dead end. So how can the spoon be part of a circuit? Well, metal conducts electricity, so the spoon is a conductor. This is also a conductor. It's mostly made of salt water, which conducts electricity. And the earth is a conductor, because damp soil conducts electricity. So I claim that there's an electrical circuit from the theremin, through the antenna, through the performer, into the earth, and then from the earth through a ground cable back into the theremin. But hang on, you might say, that doesn't make sense. There's air between the antenna and the performer, and air doesn't conduct electricity. And between the earth and the performer, there's, if not air, then at least some concrete and linoleum and a pair of socks. How can this be a circuit when there are gaps in it? Let's talk about gaps. Here's a wire. There's metal in the middle. If we zoom in, and this is not to scale, it's just an illustration, you see that there are positive and negative charges inside. In a metal, the negative charges, the electrons, are free to move around. They also repel each other, so they try to keep a distance. If we induce more electrons to enter from the left, they will repel and push the electrons in front of them, and those will repel the electrons in front of them, and so on. So all the electrons move together, and we say that the current is flowing through the wire. But crucially, the electrons aren't rubbing shoulders with each other. They repel from a distance, using the electromagnetic force, like these fridge magnets. Now let's put a gap in the conductor, like this. The electrons are trapped inside the metal and can't jump across the gap, but they still feel the electromagnetic force from the charges on the other side. So if we again push in some electrons from the left, they repel the electrons on the other side just as before, 
and for a short period of time, electrons are coming out the other end, just as before. So an electric current flows despite the gap. But the electrons keep piling up on the left-hand side of the gap. Normally, they wouldn't crowd together like this. They still repel each other and try to keep a distance. But now there is an abundance of positive charges just across the gap, and they are attracted to that, and these two forces are balanced. But only a limited number of electrons will fit next to the gap. New electrons entering from the left would have to linger at the back of the crowd, but then they wouldn't feel enough attraction from the positive charges on the other side. Those would be too far away, and so the current stops. We can induce a current in the other direction for a while, until the area to the right of the gap is crowded with electrons. Now this effect, where electrons crowd together next to a gap, is most pronounced when the conducting parts are very close together. As soon as the gap gets wider, the attraction is much weaker. So depending on how wide the gap is, it has a certain capacity to hold electrons on either side. This is called the capacitance of the gap, and we can measure how large it is by pushing electrons through the wire and checking how long it takes before the current stops flowing. You can buy precision-made gaps, capacitors. They have a specific and often large capacitance. The current can flow for a long time. In contrast, when all you've got is a pair of wires some distance apart, the current stops flowing almost immediately. The capacitance is very low. But it's still there. This crowding of electrons happens to some extent on every edge of every conductor across every gap in the universe. So when you're standing next to a theremin, there's a gap between the theremin and you, and there's a gap between you and the Earth, and we can expect to see some capacitance at each gap. When you run a current through a series of gaps like this, electrons will begin to crowd next to every gap, but the current stops flowing as soon as there's congestion anywhere along the line. And in this case, because the antenna is so much smaller than you and the Earth, the congestion will be at the gap by the antenna. So by measuring the total capacitance from the antenna to Earth, we essentially just see the capacitance between the antenna and you. And from that we can work out the distance between the antenna and you. And that's how a theremin works. But now we have a practical problem. It's hard to measure a tiny capacitance. I would have preferred to be able to just plug a couple of antennas into my Commodore 64 and somehow measure the capacitance without the need for external components. But that doesn't work, and it doesn't work for a very good reason. All signals inside an electronic device are flowing through bits of metal. There's metal in the wires, in the traces on the circuit boards, and inside the chips themselves. And every such conductor, no matter how tiny it is, is potentially a theremin antenna. That is to say, when you move your hands near any electronic equipment, the capacitance to Earth of all those tiny bits of metal will increase very slightly. But in nearly every situation, you don't want the operation of the device to change just because there is a person nearby. So in a sense, when you're designing electronics, the question isn't so much how do I build a theremin, as how do I not build a theremin? How do I build something that doesn't change its behavior when I move my hands closer. And without going into too much detail, the answer is that you build digital systems and you run them at a sufficiently low clock frequency. But think about the implications of that. This means all your appliances, all your computers and car keys and washing machines are deliberately designed not to be a theremin. They are designed to be resilient to small changes in capacitance. Imagine, if you will, an exceptional case. An electronic device so sensitive to small changes in capacitance that it could detect the slightest move of a fingertip. Such a device may be observing you right now. For if you're watching this video on a touch-sensitive display, then what you're really looking at is a matrix. A matrix of tiny translucent conductors, and when you reach for them, their capacitance increases, and this is detective, and does affect the operation of the device. So, in a peculiar sense, you may have spent a large part of your life unknowingly playing the theremin. 
but I digress. The C64 doesn't have a touch screen, so we have to build our own sensors to measure the capacitance. And for that we can use the venerable 555 Precision Timer chip. Again, the details are on my website, but the gist of it is that the 555 tries to push electrons through the capacitor here in one direction until the current stops. When that happens, it starts pushing the electrons in the other direction until the current stops, and so on, back and forth, switching direction maybe a million times per second. And here on this pin we get a digital 1 or 0, depending on which way the electrons are currently flowing. So it's going to flip back and forth between 1 and 0. And instead of an actual capacitor here, we connect this point to the antenna, and this point to Earth, because that's the capacitance we're interested in. When the hand is far away from the antenna, the capacitance is small, the current will stop flowing almost immediately, and the system will switch very quickly back and forth. And as the hand moves closer to the antenna, the capacitance goes up, and the current will flow a little while longer each time, and the oscillation slows down. But it's a small change, you can hardly see it. Therefore, the signal from the 555 is not the sound wave that you're gonna hear, because the change in frequency here is just a few percent, so you get a total range of less than a semitone for the full distance. And for a musical instrument we need maybe two octaves. So we have to measure this frequency and get a number, and then use that number to compute what the final pitch or volume should be. And that's what the computer can do for us. So the only thing left is to figure out a way to get this frequency into the computer. And wouldn't you know it, one of the lesser known features of the C64 is that it's equipped with two pulse counters, accessible via the so-called user port on the back. So we connect the 555s to the pulse counters. At the start of every video frame, we reset the counters, and 20 milliseconds later at the end of the video frame, we read out how many pulses we got within that time. And that number is proportional to the frequency. So, to recap, the distance from the hand to the antenna affects the capacitance between the antenna and Earth. The capacitance affects the frequency of the 555 oscillator. This frequency affects the number of pulses observed over a video frame. The number of pulses affects the software that controls the SID chip. And voila! Contactless first contact. Big thanks to my supporters on Patreon who make these videos possible. 